Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for this interview sponsored by Navigating Hollywood. My name is Alan Wolf and I'm a filmmaker, an author, and a game creator. Today I'm talking with Harry Yoon, the editor of Minari. We're going to be talking about his experience with this exceptional film, hopefully you've seen it by now, his love for editing, and we'll get to know Harry a little bit as well. Harry is also one of the editors of the upcoming Marvel film, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. <laughs> Sounds exciting, can't wait. But first of all, huge, huge, huge congratulations for Minardi and the Oscar nominations. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, it's like a dream come true. We're so excited. Just to get, um, I think, that kind of acknowledgement from colleagues and peers, it's it's what you dream about, I think, when you're, when you're starting off in this industry. And so, yeah, it's been a dream come true. Thank you. Incredible. I mean, a year ago, did you ever think that this is where your life would be today? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, all we was just dealing with the beginnings of like shutdown and the pandemic and everything and just grappling with that and those issues loom so large and so it's been kind of surreal to have the film come out in this environment but um, just the fact that audiences are seeing it you know in a variety of ways I mean that's just making us all so so grateful. Hmm. An amazing film so touching um, and you know when I'm curious when you first realized that you were working on a story that you thought, you know, this might really resonate with people. You know, it's so interesting because like uh, the film felt so personal from the first time that I read the script. Um, I could so identify with the experiences of the Yi family because, I mean, I grew up in the 80s uh, and my parents are immigrants. I'm an immigrant. And so this idea of being strangers in a strange land and having to kind of, um, I think not only sort of adapt, but also the dynamics that happen within the family, you know, uh, were things that I could really identify with, all the details resonated with me. And so uh, I think it was so close to home. And, and so when we were making it and what I was focused on initially was like, wow, this is really gonna bless the Korean American community, particularly the immigrant community. But it wasn't until I think we premiered at Sundance that I started to realize, no, like the specificity of this story um, seems to remind people of family relationships, no matter what their background is. Uh, and this idea of being a stranger or out of place in a particular new, new place um, is something that everyone can identify with. And I think that that specificity is what kind of made audiences lean in and maybe um, to, uh, to evoke in them specific memories of their own experience as a family member, as someone who's struggling with new experiences, um, grappling with um, the complex relationships within a family. And so, yeah, seeing it uh, with an audience that was uh, predominantly not Korean American mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was a revelation to me. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, my wife, after we saw it, she pointed out that she felt like the story could also serve as a metaphor for our times, that all of us, because of the pandemic, were put into a new experience that we weren't prepared for. We're dealing with family and community that might be new and unexpected and there's an unfamiliarity about it. And so she pointed out that it seems like a really a film a, that seems so current in that way, because I, I think, as you said, people can connect with it on the levels you mentioned, but I think you know even deeper, just as what we've been going through as a country, as a world, it seems to really connect on that level as well. Absolutely. I think when you are faced with a crisis, whatever it might be, you know, and it might be like, oh my gosh, we're going to live in this trailer in the middle of nowhere and like uproot our lives mm. or a pandemic. Like, I think it makes you start ask some really important questions about like, what's important to me? You know, what relationships are important to me? Who am I in this new role or in this new situation that I find myself in? So I think there's, I think that the experience of the Yi family in being uprooted in, in, in this like huge challenging new experience is something that, that I think resonates for all of us who've just gone through what we've gone through or 
are still in the middle of actually. So right, exactly. Now I heard that you were instrumental in getting the writer director Isaac to uh -huh. change the ending uh -huh. of the story. Is that true? Yeah, I think it's a, it was a. I think this is what I think gave me a sense of how incredibly open and collaborative Isaac is as an artist. Um, it's one, the ending was originally more of an epilogue where we followed the Yu family up to the story of, of the fire. Uh, and then we would jump forward. Do we want to give a spoiling, a spoilers <laughs> warning? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a fire in the trailer, so. Oh, okay, great, okay, great. So we're not spoiling anything, so yeah. you don't have to fast forward if you haven't okay, seen yeah. the film yet. Okay. But yeah, I mean, so we followed them up to the story of the fire and then we jumped forward in time where the kids are older um, and the adults are older. Everyone is sort of looking back on this experience. And um, my main concern with that is that I understood that that gives you a moment of reflection on what you've seen and on the, the sum of what the family may have learned. But the concern was that we've had this kind of cinematic identification, particularly with the kids. Like hopefully we've fallen in love with them and then to see them abstractly older, I think might distance us from, mm. you know, where we are emotionally at that point. And we talked about it back and forth. And, you know, one night, you know, he, he said, yeah, I, I definitely, and we were still grappling with casting and all of that. And because we were actually in the middle of pre-production at that, at, at that point. Mm. And the next morning he came back uh, and he had the pages, which are the ending now. Um, with this beautiful moment between father and son at the Minari patch, Minari patch that um, the grandmother has planted. And I was just like, oh my God, this is breathtaking. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. it's simple, it's reflective in the way that the ending was, but we're still with this family in this particular moment. And uh, I was both really amazed that he would take this collaboration and sort of, and and be open to doing something about it but also the incredible talent that it takes to come up with new pages that feel so perfect and organic you know within the space of like 24 hours and so I was just like I couldn't I was already excited to work with Isaac and it just made me that much more excited mm. the producer was not too happy with me at that point she's really? just like, I don't want to talk to him for a little while so. oh. <laughs> it's like, is it because they were headed in a particular direction and then yeah, it, it had to like and, and, and also like the that ending was what one of the things that she fell in love with on the script the script and stuff oh, like that but, wow. but I think after she saw it ultimately she was just like okay well this totally this totally works and it's beautiful so. interesting okay okay <laughs> and what's interesting about Isaac too is from what I understand he was at a turning point himself where he was about to go to Korea to teach. And uh, this film, I mean, it all kind of happened very quickly, didn't it? It's pretty miraculous. I mean, anybody uh, in your audience that knows how long it takes to raise money and then do pre-production on a feature film. I mean, this story is breathtaking. Uh, I think he finished the script in 2018 and he was actually in Korea. Hmm. teaching uh, uh, for University of Utah. He was an adjunct professor at, in a campus near Seoul. And uh, it's such a moving story because he's like, I do, you know, I'll do one last screenplay almost as a kind of like capstone, a kind of marker of where I am creatively. And, uh, and I want it to be a story of, you know, where I was in my life, where my family was in my life when I was my daughter's age, because he looked at his daughter, his beautiful daughter, and he's just like, what can I sort of tell her? What legacy can I leave to her from a filmmaking standpoint that she'll mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. And so he decided to write this screenplay. Uh, so he finished it, I think fall of 2018, you know, nobody really wanted to read it. Nobody was interested in the project. And then he gave it to uh, the woman who became his agent, Christina Chow, and she loved it you know, signed on to be his agent, showed it to Stephen Young's, uh, Stephen Young's team. Stephen loved it. He came on board. By the spring of 2019, we were in pre-production wow. because Plan B came on board through, you know, the brilliance of Christina O, oh, who's one of the producers there. She brought together a team 
somehow through Providence, she had met all of these department heads and people who were Korean American who had sort of got to a certain place where they could be considered for a plan B movie uh, and like, uh, including me, thank God, uh, because, you know, she and I had worked together on Last Black Man in San Francisco the year before. And so she brought together the team really quickly, brought together Julia Kim to do our casting. Miraculously, we were able to find these incredible actors, um, including Yeri Han, Yoon Yo Jung, who's like a legend in Korea, mm. um, our child actors like Noel and, and David uh, and Alan, who, you know, has everybody seen like how talented they are. And a great name. Yeah, it, Alan. It's, yeah Alan, exactly. We love Alan's. <laughs> um, but like, but we were shooting by that summer, uh, locked in the fall uh, in winter, and then then premiered at Sundance. The following January so mm. I mean so less than a year from when we started shooting basically is when we when it premiered and you know it won the audience award and the grand jury prize there and it was just like breathtaking it was like a miracle incredible yes yeah. I was at that Sundance standing in line to see the film but we were like 10 people away from seeing oh, it oh no <laughs> So That's close, so close. Yeah, yeah. but I, I saw the billboard on Hollywood Boulevard and uh -huh. just knowing the story yeah. of, you know, what Isaac went through to seeing that billboard, I thought, wow, I mean, just back then, if you had shown that to anyone on your team and said, this is where you're going to be at yeah. this period of time, like no one would have believed it. But yeah, I would have been like, That's a really good good Photoshop job, basically. Right. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, but so, so inspiring. Um, now, and as you said, you were dealing with a, a tight production timeline. How many days did you have to shoot the film? It was an insanely short amount of time. It was 25 days to shoot the feature. Um, as an example, you know, all of those scenes that are in the chicken sexing factory, there's like maybe eight scenes. All of those were shot in one day. Wow. Um, it was like close to, I think like 15 pages, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a crazy kind of schedule to do. Um, and then for the actors, their emotional, whatever yeah. their emotional journey is, yeah, exactly. they've got yeah. all condense into yeah. one day. <laughs> exactly. Like everything was like all the scenes for that location, except for the, except for the, um, you know, the trailer home where they, where they live. Like everything was like one day here, one day there, one day here. And so, right. again, that's, I think it just is a testament to, um, you know, uh, Providence acting um, and, and that, uh, you know, the talent that, that Isaac has and our DP Lachlan Milne has that they were able to get such beautiful material, such like perfect performances and things like that, you know, within the space of just 25 days. It's incredible. Mm. There's one moment I'd love to ask you about that when you talked about the, this scene for the, the chickens where they're, they're taking the males apart from the females and then they would actually incinerate the male chickens, right? Yeah, yeah. And there is a scene where the main... Well, that's not shown in the movie. Oh, right. Yes. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> but you see the smokestack and yeah. that's what's going to be happening. But there's a scene where the main male character, he's completely defeated. The next shot is of the smokestack and the smoke going up. Was that purposeful? Did you purposely think, I'm going to juxtapose these two together to communicate like what's happening? Oh my gosh, Alan, that's so, you're the first person to actually mention that. And like, that's one of my favorite juxtapositions. Oh, like, really? Yeah, we definitely were like, we have to call back to that, but we don't want to do it in an overt way. Uh, but yeah, I think because it's at that location too that uh, Stephen, Stephen Young, who's the character who's defeated at that point, um, Jacob says to his son, you know, males are discarded because they're not that useful. So we have to be useful, you know? And, and it's really at that time that he's reached this place where however hard he's tried, circumstances have kind of defeated him. And so mm. we wanted that to be kind of like a cinematic rev uh, resonance with that moment in, in, of where he is. So yeah, thanks for pointing that Brilliant. out. Brilliant, so good. I mean, and even my, my, I might've been the first person to mention it to you, but I think subconsciously, 
I mean, this is why I think the movie really connects with people because I'm sure subconsciously it's registering with people, even though consciously they don't, mm-hmm. might not be realizing it. And I think that's why so much of the nuance and beauty of the film really connects with people because whether they're consciously realizing or not, I think you've built in so many wonderful moments and interactions and so many unsaid, you know, interactions that you're getting one story here and another story back here. And I think that's part of what's really moving people. And I think that's what makes me love the process of editing so much Mm. because you're, you're the first audience to notice the combining and the recombining of not just images like that, of like, you know, the defeated uh, hero and then the incinerator, right? But also noticing the combining and recombining of scenes, of mm. reordering of things. And, like, and as an editor, you're the first person to react to that, to say like, oh, wow, I'm so surprised by this because it has meaning beyond our original intention. And so mm. the process itself uh, feels like a process of constant discovery. And mm. um, and as an audience, as someone who loves movies, as an audience member, like that kind of freshness and that kind of excitement is what uh, makes me love the craft, so. Mm. That's great. So do you, does it feel like when you're getting into the editing room that this is a process of le- remaking it in some level and finding those moments and creating them? Without question. Um, I think, um, what you're doing ideally as an editor is serving as an advocate or an ombudsman for the audience Mm. Um, because the director he or she has a very clear idea of what they want to say they have a very clear idea of what they want the audience to sort of feel about these characters or about this story or about this location what have you and i think your 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 primary role is as you craft the scenes, as you cut things out, as you move things around, as you determine the order of information or emotions that the audience should go through linearly as they experience a film is to be that first reaction to it, is to say, you know what, I know we want the characters, we want the audience to love this person by this point, by minute 15 here to for that to solidify, but I'm not quite there yet. What can we do to sort of through a look or gesture or a scene or a line of dialogue to help cement that relationship or, mm-hmm. you know, or to create a sense of mystery or what have you? Like, I think um, you're, ad- you're advocating for the audience to say, it's coming through or it's not coming through. And that's the dialogue that you're having with the director or with the showrunner or what have you. Now, when, when during the actual shooting, those 25 days, where were you located? Were you here in LA editing? Yeah, our cutting room was in Los Angeles, okay. uh, near Atwater Village, actually, in an uh, old exterminator building, which was hilarious. <laughs> like, there, was, there were like big pictures, like drawings of like different beetles and bugs <laughs> that they had kept. Oh from the decoration <laughs> so it, was, it was a little like a little spooky but and kind of weirdly beautiful too but uh yeah so we were there while they were shooting um in tulsa oklahoma actually uh they were shooting tulsa for arkansas basically i see okay and w- were there moments where you talked to isaac and you said listen i think we really need this shot or that shot like you were seeing holes like what are those conversations like um i think it's partly Um, you're you're a good therapist, right? Mm -hmm. So you're showing them scenes to say, hey, look, it's working. I know you're exhausted at the end of like your 80 hour week, but like, look at the beauty you're creating. And so like, I'm sending him scenes at the end of every week and Mm -hmm. giving him a sense of, you know, how the family dynamics and how the performances are shaping up. But also like, as you are pointing out, um, very practical things like we're about to wrap out on the trailer what do we need? And, you know, I would do things like beg for, please give me an exterior establishing shot so that I have a tool to create space in time. Mm. It's like, you, you can't go, cu- you can't cut to black to create emotional space in time most of the time. Mm. And so like, you know, give me that or to, to, if I need to move a scene around from day to night or, or from, or split up nights, 
I need a way to sort of establish that. So, you know, I would beg for stuff like that. Um, mm. Probably the most consequential conversation we had was, um, again, referring to the fire, there to uh, because our budget was so limited, you know, they were thinking about maybe not burning the barn down. So, and using CG fire in order to do those, those shots. And so we went back and forth and, you know, I was able to sort of, because I also have a visual effects background as a VFX editor, mm. was able to show them examples of like, well, this is what it would look like. And it mm. doesn't quite hang together if that's kind of a marquee moment. Mm. Like if it's incidental and, and this is such a cathartic moment for the family, like it has to be important. And I think, you know, I think conversations like that, both from a narrative coming from a narrative perspective to answer a technical question are uh, some of the things that we can do as editors uh, while they're shooting. Yeah, it sounds like you really were an advocate for the director for fine, you know, helping his vision come to life. Because I can see from the producer side, they're thinking <laughs> dollar signs, yeah. you know, but you're thinking story, authenticity, how can this connect with people in a meaningful way? Yeah, I mean, everything is is a negotiation, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, it's not like the producers are not advocating for story. It's that then they're like, well, then we can allocate it for this other thing. Mm -hmm. So it then becomes sort of like, how critical is it? How important is it? And that becomes a kind of uh, a matter of artistic opinion and mm -hmm. and um, taste, I guess, right? And so and so that was the kind of negotiation that was happening. Thankfully everybody that was involved with the project did it out of love and like mm -hmm. for the story. Cause like, certainly, you know, I mean, on a project of, of this modest budget, like we weren't, mo all of us weren't being paid our rates or anything like that. It was very much because we be believed in the story that Isaac was telling. And, and for a lot of us, it was so personally meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. So Now, were there scenes as you were editing that were painful to edit out of the story oh my gosh yeah um it's almost like it's almost like you have this like prophetic way of asking like uh, great questions um yes absolutely um one of the basically the last scene that we cut out of the movie was this hilarious scene probably the funniest scene in the movie Hmm. where it's at the beginning of when um david goes on the sleepover with his friend so yeah, this friend who initially said, why, why is your face so flat? And then right. they become best friends, right? So it was the beginning of that sleepover. And it's this hilarious scene where his friend is showing him, Johnny is showing uh, David how to ride a bike. But at the end of the bike ride, he's also saying, go over there, ride the bike. And he's also showing him how to flip the bird for the first time. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny he's like go over there go over there now flip me off now flip me off and of course david doesn't know what he's doing he gets it wrong he does he does it like this in, like, in this like curly way it's like it's so funny alan is so cute it's hilarious emil wrote this incredible like um score for it and it's just a delight but um it was one of those things where now at that point we had crafted the film to know exactly where we should be emotionally at that point and there's times where you can provide counterpoint emotionally and it stays just as effective but this that scene in particular took us a little bit out of where we should be and focused on in terms of where the family's mm. fortunes were at that point mm. because um you know this is soon after um Sunja, the grandma, had had a stroke and, and things like that. And so we wanted to be very careful about calibrating, you know, the story of the family at that point. And unfortunately, that was definitely one of the darlings that we needed to, to kill. Mm. Interesting. But it will definitely hopefully be on the uh, uh, deleted scenes, you know. Are there DVDs anymore? I don't know. The Blu-ray, whatever. Like right. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you can't. Even if you if you get a movie online, they they have right. extras that you can get. With okay. Them. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. it'll be in the extras. Yeah. yeah. And you know, in talking about that scene in the church where the boy asks Alan's character why you have a flat face, I th that really remind me of another reason I think the movie is connecting to people because in that same scene you see the son deal with that comment and then the 
there's a little girl who um, talks to his sister and says, I'm going to say a bunch of words. Tell me when I say something yeah. in your language. Yeah. And then she says a bunch of gibberish, but then yeah. she connects one of the words is actually a Korean word. Yeah. And she says, oh, that's a word. Yeah. But just the fact that um, I just think about the fact that those boys became friends and that boy, I mean, there's so much, it's just a reflective, I think, of the grace and redemption that just flows through the movie because we're currently in such a toxic culture where yeah. if someone said that to someone they would immediately be like whoa and yeah. it would be like a really big thing but instead they become friends and they yeah. grow and they become closer so they can understand and yeah. care for each other better so there's just so much of that in the film that i think people are really connecting with and i think that's reflective of um you know isaac's faith and also mm -hmm. reflective of how Isaac wanted to portray the people mm -hmm. with dignity in this mm -hmm. film um, to show that people are not one thing. They're not one thing that they say. And mm -hmm. I don't think that comes from a kind of Pollyanna style naivete as far as like racism doesn't exist or classism doesn't exist in this world. Of course, I mean, I think if you're a believer, um, you understand and you anticipate that brokenness is going to exist in the world. But it's how do you look ultimately at the the person behind the behavior, hmm. and is it possible to see their complexity and to see uh, them as full human beings outside of anything that they say or they do? And I think that that's definitely how Isaac views the world, and I think the way he wanted to portray his characters. Hmm. I think the most poignant example is Paul, um, who, when you first meet him, he looks so off-putting like it's the big mm. bottle glasses and his dirty shirt and you know and for a lot of people like the fact that he's praying in tongues in this weird way the first time you meet him it can be a kind of caricature of i think you know um of of a of an evangelical believer in this way but i think what you come to do is you come to see the fullness of who he is how complex mm. he is mm. uh, and and there's real dignity that I think is afforded to his faith as well. So I think in the same way that the film encourages us to look again at our parents, to look again at our children, to look again at our grandmas and, and to see their fullness and their complexity, I think it does that to every character, uh, ideally. And that was one of the priorities that we had in determining how do we craft a particular performance and how what scenes do we include or what moments do we include or exclude from particular characters hmm. that's great well is was there a, a time in your life where you thought you or realized that you had a talent with editing like a moment you thought oh this is something that i could do for a living you know it's funny because i think um there was a real pivotal moment um in my late 20s uh, I had had kind of an ambivalent relationship to fully committing to a career in film because my parents are first generation immigrants and I saw how hard they sacrificed uh, for my education. And, and did they have certain yeah. expectations? They wanted you to be this, this or this? Unspoken, you know, oh, I think okay. largely in the community because, you know, everybody talks about like, oh, you know, you know, uh, this person's son got into Stanford or this person's son got into Berkeley or, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, or that person's daughter is going to be a doctor. Or, you know, like mm -hmm. there is this kind of reverential way in which these certain milestones are celebrated. Mm -hmm. and, and so it gives you a very clear sense of what's valued. And, and I, think, um, I think I was like, how do I take such a risky move career-wise when they've, you know, sacrifice so much for my future. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think um, I think around that time when I was making the decision, I was taking a class, a night class at a, you know, a nonprofit arts organization. And I was doing a video about a, a little documentary about a 75 year old Chinese man who moved pianos for a living. Mm -hmm. And he claimed to have moved 7,000 pianos in his lifetime. And the process of like re-engaging with this subject and putting together this video and like, you know, determining when music should start and when, you know, uh, when, when to cut here and when to cut there. It just made me like fall in love with the process. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the end result I was really pleased with. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is something that I can do. This is something that I can um, 
really dive into and hopefully will be endless fast, endlessly fascinating for me as a craft. Hmm. And so that was one of the ways that I, I determined that, okay, if I am going to take this risk, which I decided to do when I turned 31, um, I'm going to do it through editing because I love the craft and very practically, I was like, I could probably get a paying job doing this faster than I could as a writer, director, or a producer. And that was a little bit of the kind of like practical approach to making an impractical decision that, mm -hmm. that I made. And, and credit to my parents, they ultimately blessed me and supported me and said that, um, you know, more than anything, when we came to the States, we wanted you to have the freedom to choose. Mm. Um, more than financial stability, we feel like that's important um, because we didn't have choices as much when we were growing up in Korea. And so, especially my father, that was a priority for him. And because I made the choice a little bit later in life, they could already see that I was, I had made good, solid, practical decisions. I, you know, had supported myself and, you know, was financially, you know, smart enough to not be starving. So I think that those two things kind of helped them to bless my career choice ultimately. Mm, that's great. And I imagine now they just must be especially happy and proud of you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, my mom is over the moon because like she's hearing from like her college alumni network. She's like, oh, Mrs. Parks called and said that she wants the film. And, you know, Mrs. Lee said she saw an interview with you in this paper. And like, so she's just the belle of the ball. Like it's, <laughs> she's having so much fun. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yes, a decision that has paid off nicely. I mean, as an editor, you are looking at scenes, you're looking at the footage, you're looking at scenes over and over. How do you keep yourself from numbing out to figuring out if something is effective or not? How do you keep yourself fresh as you look at things over and over? I think there's nothing better than time. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes if you're hitting a wall on a particular scene, it's good to put it away and then come back to it so that you, you can approach it with fresh eyes. Um, and, and, or if, even if you're in the middle of something to just stop and go take a walk or just stop and, you know, uh, have lunch or something like that to walk away and then to come back. Cause I feel like there, that's the best way to get your subconscious to come up with good ideas, but also to see something new. And the other thing that I do habitually is have other people in the room. So when I finish a cut of even the first cut of a scene, which is always you know, grossly imperfect. Mm -hmm. I always invite my assistant or a PA or somebody into the room and to just be naked and just be like, hey, what do you think? And then as soon as I start playing, I see things differently. Mm -hmm. There's something about being next to an audience member that mm -hmm. transforms your relationship to your work and you get much more objectivity to it. And so I think um, I learned that kind of like, you have to be fearless early in that process from uh, many of the editors that I worked alongside and uh, were mentored by, uh, particularly folks like Billy Goldenberg, who um, you know is a five-time Oscar nominee and, mm. and, uh, and and winner for uh, Argo. So you know, learning lessons like that of like you know don't be afraid to show imperfection early on because it uh, you have to be secure in the process and knowing that ultimately it's going to get to a better place. Mm, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, this interview is sponsored by Navigating Hollywood, which encourages and equips entertainment professionals to live relationally and spiritually holistic lives. Navigating Hollywood offers marriage courses, pre-marriage courses, and the Alpha course, where people in entertainment can talk through some of life's biggest questions. Here's a quick video about the Alpha Course. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather gonna be like? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this?
arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. If you're interested in signing up or learning more about these courses, go to navigatinghollywood.org. Harry, you had mentioned earlier about faith um, and that being something that informed the film. How do you work at living a relationally and spiritually holistic life? Mm. Well, I think there are two ways, because I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, in terms of what is the intersection of faith and work for me. Um, and one of the real benefits I would say is, I think being in the film industry, you're in an industry where it's hard to know where you stand a lot of the time, uh, especially in the middle of your, as you're developing your career, um, there aren't the traditional milestones to say like, oh, I'm making progress or, oh, I'm like secure at, at this level. Uh, so for example, like, you know, the year that I got the biggest break of my career, um, I, which was uh, co-editing Detroit with Billy Goldenberg and for Catherine Bigelow, I started that year editing a web series, which is a little much more humble, you know, level to be at. Um, I, you know, I had edited a lot of other stuff, but like, that's where I happened to find myself at the beginning of that year. Uh, and it was a quality web series, but the, and then that went well. But then later on, I was recommended to then cut a pilot for the CW, and that was like a, a big step up in terms of a, you know perceived stature and responsibility and pay and all of those things. Uh, and that went really well. But then later that year, I ended up working, you know, in a room surrounded by Oscar winners, you know, at the pinnacle of you know I think where a lot of editors want to be uh, and getting that kind of opportunity. And that taught me something really important, which was like, I'm still the same person. Like nothing has changed, you know, mm -hmm. from the person who is editing the web series to the person. And so it just feels so arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And so if I like invest so much of my identity mm -hmm. in what I happen to be doing, or for a lot of us, what I happen to not be doing, you mm -hmm. know, or I happen to not be, then it's that kind of emotional whiplash can really be debilitating. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that, that uh, you know, I, I definitely experienced coming up, you know, uh, having started later in life, I saw a lot of the people that I went to college with, you know, they were buying homes or getting married or like achieving some level of success in their careers. And here I was doing coffee runs, you know, and getting lunches for people. And, mm -hmm. I was just like, man, it's just, it's so hard to negotiate that. 
And I, I really feel like having a firm identity outside of title, mm -hmm. outside of project, outside of, you know, whatever I happen to be doing right now, and an identity that is very much has inherent value, which mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, in my, in, in my faith tradition, which is Christianity, you know, I'm told that I have incredible worth just because of who I am, no matter what I do, or no matter, you know, what I accomplish or don't accomplish, mm -hmm. that I was, that I'm incredibly worthy. And I think that that can be a very stabilizing viewpoint to, to navigate the kind of ups and downs, the inevitable ups and downs of this career. And, and I think that that's something that, you know, even now I, I really pay attention to because one of my longest mentors, um, you know, is a, is a different editor who's also an Oscar winner. He, you know, he told me like years back, yeah, I'm just waiting for the interview that I go into and I talk to the director and I mentioned the film that, you know, that, that I won the Oscar for. Right. And then he's like, oh yeah, that film, my dad loves that movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was just like, oh, so relevance. Oh, longevity. Like you're at the pinnacle of your career and you're still anxious. You have to be anxious about, will I stay relevant? Can I stay, you know? And so like that insecurity never ends. Mm. And I realized like, that's just a, a staple of, of, of what we have to grapple with. And that becomes a skill set you have to develop. And, and, I, and I say that to a lot of young people that are coming in, it's like your ability to deal with uncertainty is one of the disciplines you have to develop. And whatever you can do to stabilize yourself, uh, to, to be able to withstand that, I think is going to be a credit to, to your longevity in this, in this industry. And so, mm -hmm. That's definitely I, probably the most important and fruitful way is, is establishing an identity outside of whatever I'm doing at the time. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I've heard the one of the most miserable, miserable days in Hollywood is the day after the Oscars because <laughs> either people who thought this is going to give me significance getting this award yeah. have not gotten the award. So they don't have that sense of significance or the people who did get the reward were looking to the award for significance and suddenly realize, Oh shoot, I still don't feel that sense of significance that I thought I would feel from that. So it does seem like very powerful to find your sense of grounding and your significance outside of what others, say of you I mean I think absolutely. that's I think absolutely and I think I think that that has resonance even you know not just title to title but uh I think challenge to challenge like I I feel very much like going into an interview um you know which can be very nerve-wracking especially if you want a particular job is just to, is to know that you'll be okay no matter what happens mm -hmm. that your life isn't going to and or you know radically change necessarily as a result of the results of, of whatever happens if you get this gig or not is to be centered in that way i think makes you ultimately more relaxed ultimately uh, more versatile nimble you know in an experience like that because not everything's kind of hanging on that one thing that you have to do mm -hmm. and ultimately it's very practically uh, a, a good a great way to be centered did your spiritual or did your spiritual journey uh, impact your experience with Minari? Um, absolutely, um, uh, because Isaac's a believer, and I think uh, for the it was the first time where I could talk about the the kind of gratitude that I was feeling, the kind of um, desire to honor this material that I was feeling in very explicit terms. And so like, you know, it was the first time that, you know, before a screening with an audience, we could just pray, you know, and just sort of go into it with That's that. That's very common, by the way. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. That's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh, if it's common, like, then I must be messy. I'm in the wrong cutting rooms. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, yeah. obviously, I'm joking, but that yeah. is incredible to hear that yeah. you all you prayed before a screening. I mean, so you, that's what happened before you showed at Sundance. 
you and Isaac yeah, said before Sundance, and, but also before our friends and family screenings, you know, mm. when we were looking for feedback, like, mm. you know, we were praying for like just peace and discernment and things like that. And I think what it is, is like, you know, of course, everybody's asking for a kind of divine intervention, but more than anything, it's letting go of the burden of complete responsibility. Mm. And I think that that's so liberating is to say like, this is, you know, whatever happens, whatever we do, isn't completely up to me. I'm not alone in this, that, that, you know, I, you know, I actually have an alarm that I set uh, that goes off at 3 p.m. every day called the Holy Spirit alarm, which is, <laughs> which like, I, I hear the alarm, whatever I'm doing, and I stop and I say, thank you so much for partnering with me on these creative decisions. Thank you so much for like, you know, making me think about not just the work that I'm doing, but how relational I need to be with the people that I'm doing it. And, you know, help me remind me of that, that it's not just this deadline, but also how people are doing emotionally in the cutting room that should be my priority. So it just sort of resets me and says that it's not about me. It's not the stakes aren't about this and that I'm not alone in doing this. Mm -hmm. um, that it's about community and that it's about that kind of partnership. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and if you're watching and this doesn't make sense to you, I definitely suggest checking out the Alpha Course, which I mentioned earlier, because that's a place you get to talk about all these big questions, spiritual questions with other people in entertainment. Um, well, your next project mm -hmm. is the Marvel movie Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, tell us the ending. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kidding, I'd be so hunted down. <laughs> no, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Like this video would like get so it'd be very it'd become very viral, but then it yeah, yeah. kind of collapse yeah, yeah. underneath yeah. that. Well, now I know you can't tell me anything about the story, but yeah. for those of you who are not familiar at all with Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Uh, this is what I found at marvel.com, so we can talk about this. Sure. Uh, and it basically says, Shang-Chi is a master of numerous unarmed and weaponry-based styles, uh -huh. which when I read that, I thought, are there any other possibilities? Like, <laughs> right. so basically, he's good at fighting. And uh, the story, <laughs> this story is about him confronting the past he thought he left behind following an encounter with the Ten Rings organization, the same terror group who was behind Tony Stark's kidnapping and Iron Man. Yeah, so it's, uh, part of, it's part of the MCU. It's part of the Marvel Yes, series. amazing. I mean, I'm a big fan of the MCU movies. I just feel like they announce a title and I'm just like, I feel like I should just send them money because I'm going to go to it and I'm going to enjoy it. I mean, That's I just, great. That's great. And you're really not alone. Crazy. I mean, yeah. sure, some of them maybe I haven't enjoyed as much as others, but but I I'm a huge fan of MCU's work. Um, now, what I, I assume you must be a fan on some level. Do I am. I've watched every single one of the movies, and nice. I, I went through before I started. I rewatched a lot of them, and so yeah, just to kind of remind myself of of what what's been, so that when references come up and things like that, and story decisions happen, that you know, I'm not a total noob, so definitely. Mm. And was that like a pinching moment? Like when you found out you got this job, like, I mean, just looking at what's been happening in your career where you get, yeah. you know, this very personal kind of story that's, you know, very indie. And then this kind of film that you know is going to be seen by a gazillion people. I mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just feel again, I feel so incredibly blessed. And I feel like, you know, I, again, like I feel inoculated to not take this the wrong way in a way, mm. right? The way that it makes me different in any way. I'm still the same person. Mm. And I'm, I'm just in incredibly fortunate circumstances. Mm. So uh, every day I feel grateful and, I, and, I, and my hard work when I go in is to try to honor that, you know, try mm. to honor the opportunity but for me, I think what really excited me was the, to get the chance to work with um, obviously the, the sort of the producers at Marvel who have really, I think, created a universe where I think there's a consistently strong story and characters and, you know, to be uh, working with those folks, but also with our amazing director, Dustin Daniel Cretton, who did um, 
Short Term 12 and Just Mercy, which are these beautiful, mm. you know, very humanistically centered films. Um, and uh, my co-editor is Elizabeth Ronald's daughter um, and uh, Nat Sanders, who are just, you know, at the top of their craft. And so, you know, along with everybody else on the crew, I mean, just getting a chance to work with people like that and, you know, within a place where like, you have the resources to tell incredible stories like that was like a dream come true and the cherry on top was just you know i'm you know i'm very committed to uh diverse storytelling and to to be a part of the first asian american superhero is just that's really a dream oh amazing i mean because i think of when black panther came out and how monumental yeah. that was yeah. and how this similarly could have that kind of impact. I mean, I remember when, when you know, not too long ago, when Crazy Rich Asians came out and yeah. the studios were like, Asians go see movies? Like yeah, it was like know, such like, a what? big shock. They're like, what's <laughs> going on? And it yeah. was, <laughs> I just couldn't believe yeah. it. I was like, what? Like, I mean, so I, I mean, what, what, what were your thoughts during that process? Because that was like one of those moments where they thought, oh, maybe we should have more Asian leads in movies. You know, maybe the audience will go see them. I mean, was that a moment where you thought, you know, I mean, kind of like a duh, like, I mean, you have been neglecting this for such a long time. Like, I'm just curious what kind of went through your mind. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I found so brilliant and gratifying was that there were organizations that were saying, like Gold Open, for example, that were like, we have to vote with our dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, Hollywood's going to listen to us when we actually show up on opening weekend, when we sort of say like, yeah, it's not only, you know, uh, the right thing to do so socially or culturally, but it's also the right thing to do financially. And I think that that's a lesson that I think we have to keep reminding um, producers and studios of is that we will show up that we will stream, we will, you know, go to the premieres and things like that. And, and what I loved was that there's, that there are organizations and people that, that, um, that are willing to organize people along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, you know, a critical mass now of, of, uh, of diversity in terms of like, not only uh, in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. So people in craft yeah. positions, people in executive positions and things like that, where it's like, oh, okay, like there's new material, there's exciting material, there's a perspective that's coming into play that that is not only sort of artistically interesting, but, you know, financially potentially interesting too. And I also think that it's important to not discount the, 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 um, the, import, the impact of, of China as a market too, um, mm -hmm. where Asian themes and things like that, things that sort of are sympathetic or, or um, amenable to Asian culture is something that has like a real dollars and cents impact on the industry as well. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, I have to say that um, that plus the fact that a lot of organizations like the Academy uh, like, you know, uh, every craft guild and things like that, they, they are making it an actual priority to increase diversity in their ranks. And they're not sort of doing a lip service. They're actually, you know, making big efforts for it. So I think it's a very, very exciting time. And ultimately one that's going to benefit everybody with new stories and, you know, new perspectives. Completely. I remember the premiere of Black Panther. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of the footage or pictures from that, but the cast looked amazing and yeah. they dressed at a premiere that you typically don't see. Yeah. And I remember seeing that and thinking, I was like, well, yeah, it is the first movie that has a black superhero yeah. so, and mainly black cast. So, of course, a different expression is going to come yeah. out. And it really made me think, what are the other expressions that we have not seen yet? Yeah. And I think your this upcoming film could potentially be one of them. But I can't wait to see the ripple effect of that and just what we can experience as an audience and even as a culture, as a world, because we're seeing something from a perspective that we haven't seen before. Yeah, you and me both. I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for the premiere. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, what was it like going from an indie film to yeah. a major studio film? Um, I mean, it's 
it's, you know, it's funny because like, I think the heart of the process is still very much the same, hmm. but the resources uh, of this level of storytelling is breathtaking. I hmm. think, you know, in the same way that like um, Pixar has a process where they anticipate changes, they anticipate uh, having to, you know, do the, the hard work of making room for changes, even like big changes, late breaking uh, in order to get it right, is very similar to the way um, I'm seeing in Marvel, they make movies that they anticipate that it won't be perfect the first time. And there's a real wisdom, I think, in that. And they're willing to commit the dollars and the resources to make sure that that happens, which is why I think you're the audience has noticed there's this kind of consistent quality that comes out from that studio. And so I think that's been really interesting. Um, Cause like, you know, like in notes meetings and stuff like in reviews, like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about something and then it'll actually get done instead of like, Oh, we can't do that. And I was just like, Whoa, they're actually doing that. They're actually changing that animation or they're, wow. they're actually, we're actually going to try this out or we're going to reshoot this. Like that, that kind of like openness to sort of like, understanding the process is really breathtaking uh, to be a part of. Mm. Uh, but it, uh, I think because I came up as an assistant editor and a visual effects editor on bigger films, like for example, I was the VFX editor on The Revenant and- um, And for people who don't know what a VFX editor is. Oh, yeah. It's somebody who is the interface between all of the visual effects entities like visual effects houses and you know coordinators and producers and stuff and what happens in the cutting room because the the cut is always changing and shots are being replaced and scenes are being changed and stuff so it's much more of an organizational technical position that says to all of the vendors oh by the way that shot that you've been working on that's no longer in the movie or oh by the way like here's three other shots that are there in their place and so it's this constant that that communication has to happen quickly e efficiently and that's what a visual effects editor is largely a part of hmm. yeah amazing that i mean i'm sure you, just to imagine how much that ex that experience prepared you for taking on this role yeah i mean i just that's why i feel so grateful as long as a, a journey as it's been that it i you know i i feel so grateful that everything that i've learned uh both good and bad you know, is something that that has kind of equipped me to feel comfortable, um, you know, in, in this in this expanded capacity. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm very familiar with uh, films on this scale because you know I came up in those cutting rooms, and so I think there's real uh, value um, as as hard as it was to be an assistant editor, as hard as it was to to sort of be waiting for that shot. I feel like every every one of those jobs kind of seasoned me for an experience like this. And uh, the other thing I'm sure it's very different on this film is that the fact that it has three editors. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the size? Like why three editors? So uh, very practically, it's actually two editors where we had a little bit of uh, overlap where I replaced one of the editors uh, because she needed to move on to her next film. Uh. This, this, uh, this, because of COVID and they were shooting in Australia, um, the schedule got extended by, I think, over six months. Mm. So they were there basically 100% longer than they were supposed to be there. Wow. And so everything got pushed. And so like, unfortunately, it started to overlap with their next, uh, her next project. And so I came on to sort of uh, take her place uh, and there were huge shoes to fill because uh, Elizabeth is a legendary editor. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, in terms of working with two, any kind of a team, I think you have to sort of, uh, A, begin with respect, with mutual respect and good communication. Um, and I think um, we decided pretty early on on how we wanted to divide the film. And it's not always this way. Like, it's not, a, the way we did it was like, you'll work on these sections and I'll work on these sections, mm -hmm. right? Whereas actually I came in, I was the junior editor. So, so I was like, what sections would you like me to work on? <laughs> so, and then, you know, the, we've been kind of staying with those sections through the process, but I think I've been on other projects. Like, for example, I was an additional editor on First Man where, you know, we 
in various times touched every scene in the film practically mm. you know in, in in different capacities and so it really depends on the project but it 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 fundamentally requires respect uh and great communication mm. just like any kind of pivotal relationship like a marriage or you know like being in a family or something like that so right yeah, yeah. And, you know, obviously, I'm sure this this film has a lot of visual effects. Oh, yeah. and does that mean the footage that you work with typically looks incomplete green screens like is it is that kind of what the process looks like? Absolutely. I mean, it's I mean, it's pretty complicated because it begins with what's called pre vis or pre visualization where they're almost like animated storyboards and that helps the filmmakers determine what to shoot and which angles to get and because you're when you're when you're dealing with something with a lot of visual effects there's a lot of layers involved right so there's the background layer which could be a, an entire cg landscape for example and certainly is true in, in marvel films where that's often the case right uh, there's the hero layer which is the actual performance by your actor or actress and then you know they could be interacting with cg characters or they could be interacting and so that that's its own sort of requirement and then there's you know all sorts of you know additional things that need to be composited in there and so you may have one or another of those layers in the cut at different times hmm. uh, and you have to sort of be able to comment on that and also see how does as the shot changes in terms of its depth, in terms of its complexity, in terms of its detail, how does that change the decisions that you've been making in terms of its width? Like how long is it? Does it need to breathe more? Does it need to, uh, can it be more compact for the sake of pace or action, that type of thing? So uh, unlike you know a small intimate family drama in which you don't have to worry about the evolution of a particular shot, um, in this kind of film, you definitely do. You have to sort of deal both with width and depth in terms of- And do, have you ever found that later when the VFX are come in that then you realize, oh, I need to, we need to actually edit this differently because it's just not working once all of that is in place? Absolutely. It's oh. this constant uh, evolving process. And, mm. um, and, and so I, I think, you know, I think you learn early on as you're coming up as an editor is to not be precious about anything. Mm. you know, uh, that it's fluid constantly. And I think, I think, you know, the, the editors that I've most been influenced by are the people that just are, that never rest until, you know, it can be that much better. You know, they're mm. constantly improving. They're constantly open to taking apart even this really delicate construction that they've made, because it's only through that sort of breaking apart, re remaking, breaking apart, remaking, that something really great emerges. So. Mm. I'm curious how you keep yourself just inspired as an artist. <laughs> do you do are there regular habits that you have, or what what do you do to just keep yourself going? Well, I think what really helps is not just to focus on the work, but to focus on the people too, uh, and that's been a real eye opening thing. My wife, um, she's an attorney and she has she's had her own law firm for close to 20 years uh, it's an immigration firm and the way she approaches her work isn't just case by case it's also person by person so not only the clients that come through her doors but every one of her employees the associates the receptionist you know everybody that she realizes that she's there in that workplace not just to do the work but to have strong and flourishing relationships with everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing how she, and, and that could have consequences that are not necessarily good for business. Like um, for example, there's one attorney, a junior attorney she hired that literally like three weeks after she started to work, she had this really traumatic breakup with her boyfriend. And so she was very unproductive for like the first like one month, you know, and she's a brand new hire. And I think the right That's business, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to, sorry, Becky. <laughs> no, but like, I think the right business decision might've been to be like, Hey, I'm sorry, this isn't working out, you know, but instead like they really cared for her and hmm. nurtured that relationship and, and, and ministered to her through that process. 
but what that created was that cemented this really strong and loyal relationship between employee and employer, uh, where she's so invested in the success of this firm, not because just because of the work that they do, but because this is, you know, this is a community, this is a group. And I think she really in doing and running her business like that. And I, I realized like, oh, like this is something I need to bring to the cutting room to say like, I need as busy as I am, I need to stop and have this conversation with our PA mm. to find out how he or she is doing, you know, mm. like I need to ask, you know, the, my assistant editor, like, what do you want to do next? You know, what's important for you? Um, how do I invest in your success? You know, like that type of thing. Mm. And that kind of uh, investment, I think, in people keeps things new and keeps things because people are endlessly fascinating and endlessly problematic, right? Like it keeps things interesting and not just sort of fixated on the work itself. Mm, that's great. And what about as an editor, are there regular things that you do to keep yourself sharp and keep your eye kind of sharp as an editor? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think probably the greatest thing is constantly inviting audiences in. I mm -hmm. think that's what really, really helps is no matter where I am in the process to invite people into the cutting room, invite, you know, uh, whoever happens to be passing by to look at something, because that changes the way that I look at, at something. And what, and that's one technique. Another technique is maybe just take walking away and like, you know, putting something away and working on something else. Cause I know that if you just watch something over and over and over again and like hit your head against the wall, it's not gonna get any better because you're not gonna have fresh insights into it. Mm. In other words, like you're constantly trying to re-invoke the audience inside of you and not just the craftsperson. Mm. That and that kind of dual mindset is so important for an editor to have. So whatever you can do to sort of get out of the mode of being the craftsperson of like, forcing a cut to, to work in a particular way and just sitting back and saying, okay, no, I'm going to watch it now. That's when you get your bit, your best insights, basically. Mm, that's great. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that it, there, it must be a lot of work at working <laughs> as an editor, um, yeah. a lot of hours. How do you balance between your work and your family life? I think early on, it was very hard uh, because I think, if you want to edit, you often start off as an assistant. I started off as a PA, then an apprentice, then a second assistant, then a first assistant and et cetera. But even during that whole process, you're usually working anywhere from 50 to 60 hour weeks. You know, sometimes I'm busy, busy times even longer than that. You also have to make time to actually edit because these junior positions, you're often not editing, you're organizing, you're getting lunch orders, you're doing everything but editing, but you have to remember what you ultimately want to do in terms of your craft. And so I think early on, it was so hard because like, you know, I would finish the, a, a work day and uh, on the first, one of the first features I recut, I'd finish my work day at like eight or nine o'clock. And then the director would come in and then I would work with them until like one o'clock, you know? And so like, that's that unfortunately that's just a little bit of what you have to do and even in your rest times your breaks it, like if you're on a tv show as an assistant like you have to then during the rest period then spend that time cutting an indie feature or cutting you know a pilot or cutting something else and so uh it there isn't much of a balance early on um but i think what i found is that if you're not afraid to share why you are prioritizing a particular activity like with producers or with you know key creatives and stuff and if your relationship is strong with that person that often that it's important to make the courageous decision to ask sometimes you know can i have this wednesday night off because you know we we host this thing or can i have you know this weekend off or are you okay with you know my having this weekend off because you know this it you know it's my kid's birthday or something like that you know like it's i think you have to have the courage to ask but i think the way you develop that courage to ask is by developing credibility 
as somebody who is trustworthy and is a good collaborator and who cares as much about the project as, as they do, but also, um, yeah, but also because you've invested in that relationship. So. Well, for someone who is interested in having a career as an editor, yeah. what advice would you have for them? Uh, I would say edit. So find a way to, to try it out. It's really important because like the process is so, because movies and TV shows feel so seamless as we're reading them or as we're watching them, right? That it feels like it would be easy to create, right? So I think like you have to try it to understand how difficult it is, how even a frame makes a difference, how, you know, angles make differences. So I think you have to practice. The second thing is watch classic movies. I think it's very important to break yourself out of whatever is the milieu of the day because it's the result of those conversations that we've been having about cinema is where we are right now. So we're looking at sort of the evolution and not necessarily the building blocks. And I think by going into that history, that incredibly rich history, not only do we sort of like start to see how certain techniques were developed, but also to see how masters um, told stories, what characters that, you know, masters were investing in and things like that. And so I think um, I see gaps a lot in cinema literacy with, with you know, young filmmakers sometimes. And, uh, you know, they're just sort of like caught up in whatever is streaming now and mm -hmm. wanting to imitate that. But I think it's really, really important to have that kind of literacy because I can guarantee you that the people you want to work with have that literacy. And, you know, when, when you have conversations with them in an interview, when, you, when they're looking, they're, they're seeking collaborators, they want people that can speak that language, uh, that, can, that has that, that depth of understanding of where we've come from. Uh, and Because I think um, ultimately great editors are great filmmakers. And I think you have to have adopt that mindset to be a true collaborator. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time, Harry. This has oh, been- and I had so much fun, thank you. Oh, good, well, I really appreciate hearing your thoughts and, and just, and it's very just inspiring to hear more of your story and, and where you find your significance and how that helps you to navigate through uh, this career that you're having, which is amazing. So thank you for that. Thanking, thank you to all of us who have joined us. Uh, please again, check out navigatinghollywood.org to find out more about what Navigating Hollywood has to offer. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. So thank you for joining us. And again, thank you for Harry. Thank you.